As you may remember, the cycle of readings for the Sunday Mass, which always includes four readings, the first is usually from the Old Testament except during the Easter season when it's from the Acts of the Apostles, and then one of the Psalms, which we normally sing, and then an epistle from the letters of the Apostles in the New Testament, and finally an excerpt from one of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And this, these readings are not arranged as kind of haphazardly or chosen at random. They typically follow a pattern or logical unfolding. And on Sundays, they're arranged in such a way that the first reading from the Old Testament corresponds in some way to the reading from the Gospel. The Epistle is on a separate kind of track, and it has its own kind of secondary theme. But the first reading and the gospel somehow relate to one another, so much so that they shed light on each other. And that Old Testament reading often gives us a means of, of seeing how we can interpret or understand the gospel, or the gospel fulfills what is revealed in the Old Testament. There's some connection between them. So it's always a good exercise, especially if we read the readings in advance, to really try to pay attention to the connections because they may teach us, not may, they will teach us something important about what Jesus is saying in the gospel. And so, what was that first reading about? Um, from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Well, he's praising a foreign emperor, a foreign king, Cyrus the Great, the king of Persia, the emperor of that great empire that he himself built through conquest about more than 500 years before Christ. And why is he praising Cyrus? And who's also praised in the book of Ezra and in uh, either First or Second Chronicles. Because usually the Gentile rulers, well, they're not praised in the scriptures. They're usually criticized because they're enemies of the chosen people more often than not. And they're enemies of the true God more often than not. But here Cyrus is praised. He's praised to the extent that he's even called God's anointed. There are only two people in the scriptures that are called anointed. One is Jesus and the other is Cyrus the Great of all people. The word Messiah is applied to him. I mean, that's extraordinary when we think about it. And what was so exceptional about Cyrus the Great? I mean, he was a, a Middle Eastern potentate, a powerful man who acquired power through conquest. According to the historians of the day and those who followed, he had a reputation for virtue. And he was known to be a faithful husband to his wife until she died. But by, the, by our modern standards, we would certainly classify him as a tyrant. So what was so exceptional about Cyrus? Well, it was Cyrus the great, who permitted the Israelites who had been in exile in Babylon to return to the Holy Land. And he helped them, he funded the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem, a temple that had been destroyed. At the time, the Israelites, the remaining Israelites from the tribe of Judah mostly were, were exiled into Babylon. Well, when Cyrus conquered the Babylonian empire, he allowed the Israelites to return to their native land. They still were under his control. He still ruled that area. But they were allowed to resume their identity as a nation. They were allowed to rebuild the temple and to begin again the worship of God according to the rites of the Old Testament in that temple. And so the great the prophets, Isaiah, one of the greatest prophets, and Ezra and others, pray Cyrus as being an instrument that God used. An imperfect instrument, certainly by any measure, but if we're dividing up all of humanity into perfect instruments and to imperfect instruments, the subset of perfect instruments would have one person. The Blessed Mother would be under the perfect instrument category. Everybody else would be imperfect instruments to one extent or another with greater or lesser degrees of imperfection. But Cyrus was used as an instrument by God to accomplish a great good to help reconstitute Israel in that final stretch leading up to the coming of the Savior, which would happen some centuries later. Well, so how does this relate to the gospel? Well, clearly, we see a, we see a connection between God's will and the will of the state. And the question is, how do those things relate? How do we respond as a believer to the will of God within a secular society that may have a different kind of trajectory. Here we see in Cyrus's case, at least in this edict, 
God's will and the, the will of the state corresponded. They were in harmony. That doesn't always happen. In fact, many times it does not happen. We can consider that in just a moment. But Jesus takes up this question in a certain way when he's, when he's asked whether or not it is lawful for the Israelite, who's, who is a part of the chosen people, to pay taxes to the occupying power of the Roman government. Is it lawful to pay the census tax to Caesar or not? And we're kind of hoping, even though we know the answer, we're kind of hoping that Jesus will say, no, it's not lawful. You shouldn't be paying taxes. But he doesn't say that. He says, well, show me the coin. Whose image is on the coin? It's Caesar's image. Well, then render under Caesar what belongs to Caesar and repay to God what belongs to God. I mean, it's really a remarkable statement, especially since it follows all of these parables and teachings about the kingdom of God. And so they're kind of saying, okay, practically speaking then, what does this kingdom of God, quote unquote, mean for us concretely? How does it change or affect our being part of this empire? Are we going to be perennially rebels against the state? Are we going to withdraw from the state and have no connection with it whatsoever? What's our relationship with it? That's a legitimate question. And Jesus makes some distinctions. Well, first of all, he makes a declaration, and then he makes a distinction. And the declaration, repay to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, is another way of saying that a citizen, regardless of their religious beliefs, owes respect to the laws of the country in which they live. Now that's not a limitless respect, but in general we have a responsibility to participate in civil society and in civil order, not to withdraw, not to hide, not to distance ourselves, not to give up voting because we've become cynical and we say, well, nothing really changes. That is not true. Um, and granted, our influence as an individual is very small, but that doesn't mean it's inconsequential. So on the one hand, Jesus is saying, yes, we live in a civil society, even when it's uncivil. We live in a civil society, and we have a responsibility to take part in that society. But then he makes a distinction. He may say, well, we're paid to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. He goes on to say, and to God what belongs to God. So repay to God what belongs to God. And so the distinction, the distinction is, yes, be a good citizen, but only give the state what belongs to it, nothing more. Don't give them any more authority than is absolutely necessary. Because we know that even the best government, a cursory glance at, at world history, reveals this to be true. Even the best government tends to want to acquire power or acquire authority or acquire dominion, which reduces the freedom and the liberty of the individual. And sometimes it's, it's important or necessary for, that, for the governing authority to, to uh, amalgamate power to itself. For example, in defending the country against an attack or an invasion, that sort of thing. Uh, and there are many other examples. But there is a limit. And so the question is, really, how do we understand and live by this teaching? To give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, but giving to God what belongs to God, not letting Caesar overstep the legitimate bounds of governance. And I think it, it helps us to understand, or to address this question by understanding, that laws, for the most part, are based upon one of two things, either the, the natural law, in other words, it's based upon the truth of what people are. The laws against murder are based upon the fact that every individual has an inherent dignity okay, and, a, and a right to life that it has, should absolutely be protected and assured by the state. But most laws are prudential judgments. That means that society or its governors see there's a problem and then try to come up with a solution to the problem. So to give a kind of silly example, after the advent of the car a century or so ago, it became necessary to have traffic laws. It became necessary to put up stop signs or have traffic lights and maybe lanes that are divided on the freeways or on the highways or the roads, whatever it may be. And you know, it'd be an interesting question. I'm sure you could Google this. Don't do it now. 
But who came up with the idea of a stop sign being a, an, a red octagon with the word stop printed on it? The stop part we get, but why a red octagon? Why not a triangle? Why not a circle? Why not a square? Why not a big flapping bird, you know? Um, someone made a decision. It was a prudential judgment. So they might have had different options. There might have been some committee. It's okay, we have, we'll either use this yellow circle or we'll use this green triangle or we'll use this red octagon. And they decided for whatever reason to choose the octagon. And that's what we have as, our, as a universally recognized stop sign. There's several stop signs in the parking lot which people ignore all the time, but they're there. <laughs> right by the double bumps, they figure I've suffered enough with the double bump, speed bump, I'm not gonna stop at the stop sign because I'm already going like half a mile an hour because of the speed bumps. The Father Locky Memorial Speed Bumps, I call them. <laughs> he loves that name for them, by the way. And, and so this is a prudential judgment. Now, a lot more important questions are also, are also um, resolved by making a prudential judgment, a judgment in prudence, a decision made after considering all the options, in other words. And people can agree about the principle to be addressed and disagree about the way it's resolved. A society and, and individuals within a society can agree that yes, as a, as a people, we need to try to have a response to help those who are poor, who are sick, who are needy, or whatever other, whatever other category of need we might determine. And that's a principle in which everyone can theoretically agree, and we should agree. But the options for addressing that, the, the, the solution might admit of several different kinds of options. And several different approaches. There could be a hundred different approaches to any one of those problems, and they could all be legitimate. And it takes a, it's a question of kind of hashing it out and having discussion and dialogue and trying to work out compromises to take maybe the best elements from each of the proposals. But the, in the end, those are prudential judgments. And reasonable people can agree on the objective, but disagree on the solution. And we should never let that disagreement, when we agree on the objective, we should never disagree, even though we disagree on the solution, we should never let that disagreement become so bitter that it divides us from people. But use it as an occasion to try to work out some compromise. Um, and this is true in the level of just friendships as well as civil uh, action so that that objective can actually be obtained and the problem resolved. So the, those are prudential judgments. Most laws and most legislation has to do with making a prudential judgment. But there are matters that are absolute, that are based upon the natural law, that are based upon the, the way in which God created us. I made reference to one, um, the law against murder. Murder would still be wrong if, if it were legal. And of course, some murders are legal in our society. They're still wrong. And there are, it points to the fact there's some matters that are absolute. The question of the protection of human life from conception till natural death is an absolute. And whether a, a, a society recognizes that in its laws of governance or not, it remains an absolute truth that a Christian cannot compromise. It's an era in which there is no middle ground. It's, the, it admits of only one kind of solution, which is the protection of that life from beginning to end. And there are other matters as well that we could mention. But you know, if we get the things that are absolute, the foundational matters, if we get those things wrong, then everything that's built upon that shaky foundation is not gonna have a very substantial um, possibility of survival. If a society is built upon things that are disordered, whatever's built will also inherit that disorder. So we've got to get as individuals and as a society, the foundational things right. And if we don't get those things right, even in our civil laws, we're going to be making huge mistakes. For example, there's a fundamental right to freedom of religion, freedom of conscience with regards to religion, not just freedom of worship. Some want to limit that to freedom of worship. But everyone has an inherent right of religious liberty, not just to worship God as they see fit, even in ways in which we disagree, again, the individual has the right to maintain the integrity of their conscience in terms of their 
religious liberty and the way they exercise their religion. It's not to, it can't be reduced just to freedom of worship because freedom of religion encompasses ideally the whole person and will shape their whole life. We know that our being a Christian is not limited by our participation in Sunday Mass. It's enhanced by that, it's strengthened by that, it is energized by that, and maybe our identity is rooted in that, but ideally it extends beyond into a life of charity and a life of goodness, a life of generosity, and into a life of a relationship with God through our prayer, etc. If we get the foundational things wrong, everything else will be on shaky ground. And so the question arises for us, what do we do when there's a conflict? If we're to render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and render to God the things that are God, what do we do when there's a conflict? Well, I think maybe two or three things we can, three things in particular we can keep in mind. Not in any particular order. One is that we don't want the perfect to be the enemy of the good. Cyrus the Great was not perfect. The apostles were not perfect. We're not perfect. If we're waiting for the perfect, either in terms of public policy or public figures or elected officials, if we were waiting to vote for the perfect person, you know, we got to be really patient because we're going to be waiting until the day we're dead. They will never come. Not going to happen. We know that. So we don't want the perfect to be the enemy of the good. It's possible to tolerate inadequate or imperfect laws, inadequate or imperfect leaders. We can tolerate that, like Cyrus, as long as they're stepping stones on the way to a better outcome. You know, if there's some great issue of human dignity that needs to be addressed, it's all right to address that gradually if that's the only way it can be addressed. If we can't make a 180 degree turn right away, well, we can start making little incremental changes as a society that can move us in the right direction. It's perfectly fine to, to, to work on those little changes even knowing that the big picture is so much, has so much more work to be done. So we don't want the perfect to be the enemy of the good. Secondly, we can't sacrifice absolute goods like the right to life, for example, or the right to religious liberty. We, can't, we cannot sacrifice those absolute goods for matters of prudential judgment. So I could say, well, I, I like this particular uh, political platform or political vision because it corresponds to 80% of the prudential judgments that I would make. But it gets these basic things wrong. Well, then I think it's very difficult to support something that may correspond to our prudential judgments but gets the foundational truths and, and judgments wrong. Because ultimately, that'll mean all the prudential judgments will be wrong. Maybe not right away, but eventually. So we never want to sacrifice our support and, and, uh, and uh, um, working for the protection of absolute goods simply because there may be a preponderance of prudential judgments that we like, that this person or this movement is posing. So we don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. We never sacrifice ultimate goods for prudential judgments. And third, I think this might be more important, we shouldn't be obsessed about politics. We shouldn't be obsessed with politics. We shouldn't let politics rule our life. We should be obsessed. We should be obsessed with the gospel. What would our world look like if every Christian, instead of being obsessed with politics, and not every Christian is, you know, some are perhaps, and it's not that we lay aside our concern or the desire we have for improvement of our, our society, government, etc. I mean, we, have, we, we are to render to Caesar, but only those things that are Caesar's. We don't be, be obsessed with politics. We should be and want to be obsessed with the gospel, obsessed with God, obsessed with following him, obsessed with doing his will. And if that's the, the fundamental identity of our life, that we are children of God, not that we belong to one party or another party, or that we have a tradition in our family voting this way or supporting these things, all, that thing might be, all those things might be good to one extent or another. Our fundamental identity, again, if we get this wrong, we'll get a lot wrong. Our fundamental identity is a child of God. As a Christian, through baptism remade, into the image of Christ and united with him through grace. 
We forget that we get that wrong. Lots of other things we're going to get wrong. But if we get that right, that can change and recolor the whole way we look at things so that we're not easily categorized into one side or another or somewhere in between, so that we're not automatically uh, feel that we're required to, to vote or support a particular person, platform, or movement. The only movement we're interested in, really, is the movement of the gospel and the movement of the Holy Spirit. And before that can happen in our society, it has to happen in you and it has to happen in me. What would our life be like if we were truly obsessed with the gospel? If the words of Jesus really shaped our whole life? Well, why don't we, why don't we begin to envision that possibility? Why don't we think about it? Why don't we consider it? And then begin to live it so that what we envision can actually come to pass and what we desire can actually become real.